double dip uh, recession is mainly uh, linked to the problems that prevail in the financial sector and the financial sector resolution. Malaysia, like the other Asian economies, are not facing a financial sector crisis. Our financial sector is solid and sound. Things are getting better. I mean, even on the ground, you can actually see anecdotal evidence where private consumption has actually started to improve. Housing sales, for example, has started to pick up. And, uh, and generally, the results from Malaysia has been pretty much in line. Um, it shows that it does have a base for, um, for some growth uh, later on uh, this year or even 2010. Now, optimism about Malaysia's economy being supported by the country's central bank governor, you heard from her slightly earlier. That's despite Malaysia's back-to-back -back GDP declines, which puts it into a technical recession for the first time in 10 years. Second quarter GDP fell 3.9 percent on persistent weakness in exports. However, the slump was still less than economists had it forecast. The expectation is, therefore, for growth to improve in the second half of this year and going into 2010 um, with the accelerated implementation of the fiscal stimulus measures, the lower rate of inflation and the continued access to financing. Uh, we uh, expect uh, all these uh, to provide continued support for the economic recovery. Now, it remains to be seen whether the markets will share that optimism. Malaysian stocks have gained 34 percent this year, which, as you can see, makes them the worst performers in Southeast Asia. Now, let's take stock of Malaysian stocks with... Who else? Raymond Tang, who oversees close to $6 billion in assets at CIMB Principal Asset Management. He joins us from Kuala Lumpur. Raymond, it's always good to have you with us. I mean, we saw that 30% gain, but Malaysian stocks are still lagging behind their peers in Asia. Do you expect that to continue going forward? Well, I expect that to continue. If you look at a perspective from uh, your 30% the gain this year to date, uh, last year, we also fell the least, so about 30 percent, so we are deemed a lower volatility market. If you look at the other extreme, we had China, which fell 70 percent last year, and after a year to date, they've recovered half of their, half of their uh, losses. So it, it it's becomes a measure of statistical basis. Uh, I would like to look at it from a peak to trial, let's say from the peak before the crash up to now at this point. If you look at that perspective, Malaysia is the second best performer up to July last month, uh, better than even the developed markets, better than even China. So we have basically, we have let, we have uh, outperformed the way down, underperformed the way up, but that's to be expected because Malaysia is still deemed a low beta market. But Raymond, what do we do in this type of environment? What are the best bets now in Malaysia? Well, the best bets, I think, are still all these big sector bets. Uh, we are still bullish on banking. I think that the uh, expectations of higher NPLs uh, and uh, much lower loan growth uh, did not pan out. So we did not expect that to happen. We expected the credit uh, control to be very tight among all the banks. The banks are still very conservative. and. None of the Malaysian banks had any investments in any of the uh, CDOs, uh, CLOs. So there was nothing to basically write off on the balance sheet. So we are still positive on banks in that sense. Um, the other sectors that we are basically also positive on is infrastructure, construction, and uh, oil and gas, where the trust of the, the next wave of the government spending will focus on. And in terms of banks, I'm looking at the best performers. CIMB and AMMB have outperformed. And other performers on the KLCI include MMC and Guntik. I know you can't talk about specific stocks, but when you take a look at all these big gainers, have they are gains overdone? I would think that uh, it was overdone on the downside. Uh, so that it's basically at least what you call a mean reversion type of trade. And if you see that uh, among all of these, uh, the, a lot of this, the, the main trade of uh, a lot of them are because a lot of them are have basically gone beyond Malaysian shores and have uh, basically regional uh, operations so you are buying into a Malaysian listed 
entity, but basically the operations are gradually growing into offshore. If you think, for example, Genting, I mean, the much hyped uh, IR resorts in uh, Singapore. So those are one of the examples we see Malaysian companies going uh, diversifying. So we think we do not think that the the rebound this round is overdone. Raymond, I'm going to bring in Luca at this point in time. Of course, Luca is our guest host for Asia Confidential today. Luca, go ahead. Yes, I have a question for Raymond. Uh, hi, Raymond. Uh, hi. What do you think of, of, of uh, the export sector? Because I think one of the big bets in the next uh, 12 months, as far as market is concerned, is how uh, our trade, our international trade, will recover if it recovers to the level 2007 or 2005 or 2003. So how, what's your take on, on, on the export sector? Well, the export sector for Malaysia is basically divided into mainly two different segments. If you look at the resource side, we have CPO, crude oil. I think that should continue to do well. Prices there are relatively firmer and less volatile, and it's basically driven by global demand. Uh, of a, a bit more concern will be your, your basically your E and E exports, your electronics, which are basically your semi-finished goods, which are shipped over to other production centers to be assembled in the final products. So that will be dependent mainly on the consumption recovery uh, globally, not in the U.S. but also in uh, Asia as well because we are feeding components into all the finished goods, be it the LCD TV or washing machine or air con. Um, typically, we are part of that global supply chain. I think that that would uh, have a bit more of a struggle recovering as uh, consumers start uh, cut back on a big item spending, but still focus on the staples instead of discretionary spending. Raymond, just one final question before we go to break. How much opportunities do you see in GLCs, the likes of Maybank, Telecom Malaysia, Malaysian Airlines? The government has been doing a lot to restructure these companies. Well, I think that uh, if you talk about this uh, banks per se, um, there are opportunities there. If you look for it, you're just investing to make positive returns. However, as a uh, regional fund manager, if you benchmark uh, Malaysian banks against all their regional banks, you, if you look at them from a growth prospect and from an earnings growth perspective, uh, Malaysian banks do not stand out among the top picks in the region. Right, because of the uh, lower growth, in, lower trajectory in loan growth compared to say a uh, the newest kid in the block, Indonesia, which are doing double-digit uh, growth. So right. from that from that perspective, I would you would think that yes, we are going to achieve positive returns, uh, but on the relative Raymond? performance, we are not, yes. We'll pick up a discussion right after this break. Raymond Tang joining us from uh, CIMB. Offer a short break. Let's stay with Malaysia. Back to our chat with Raymond Tang, Chief Investment Officer at CIMB Principal in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we were talking about uh, GLCs slightly uh, earlier, Raymond. Um, has there been much interest from uh, foreign funds in these companies? I think there are a fair number of interests. Uh, uh, but uh, the interest here, I would think that is less than we've seen in the prior years. Uh, because if you look at it on a sector basis, uh, you, have this, you can get the same sectors anywhere in the region. So you have to look for it from a main trust on the business plan perspective. What are you doing? Um, have you survived the, uh, the risk management crisis the last two years? Has your management style been very robust in this environment? Is it the correct style going forward? Is your business plan correct? I mean, a lot of, a lot of if we talk about banks as a representative of the GLC is all invested in, I think that a lot of them has basically have a myriad of report, report carding over the, over the region. So your best upside is uh, typically from your worst banks because they've been best down on the worst. And uh, your least performing upside is basically those who have survived because there's no surprises to be right, written back, no bad loans to be written back at all. Hey, in terms of uh, changes, the current government has tried to implement changes to overhaul the financial markets, overhaul the economy. What impact and when do you see that impact taking place? Well, a lot of this impacts, uh, a lot of these uh, reforms that you're doing, it's um, <clears throat> targeting many a reform, at reform in the financial sectors. I think it's a good start. Um, I think that uh, we are still somewhat uh, slightly behind some of our regional comparators in terms of uh, market access, market inform information, and uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, 
reforms per se, but um, I think uh, what has been always the Malaysian uh, trait is that the execution and the consistency in the execution has always been uh, somewhat of a question mark over the last uh, 10, 15 years. So the consistency and uh, to follow through, all, all this needs, still needs to be seen. Right. Uh, Raymond, at this point in time, let, let's get to the emails that we've been getting. Uh, Asad writes with this question, do you think the iShares MSCI Malaysia Exchange Traded Fund is a good way to invest in Malaysia? Well, typically, exchange traded funds are basically uh, for those who want access, immediate access to a country, and typically interest in uh, ETFs are from outside the country. So if you are a foreign investor, if you are a foreign in individual which does not want to, want to have an instant portfolio of a stocks with represented index, that will be the easiest access. You don't need to do... Uh, you don't need to buy a basket of 30 stocks. There's just one stock which mirrors the 30 basket. So that will be an ideal product for someone who is outside of that uh, geographical country uh, to invest in in the instant. Let me bring in uh, Luca at this point in time. Luca, we we've talked about the Malaysian market all this while, but we agree that there's been a lack of uh, a, a foreign investor interest in that particular, particular market. What's your take on why that is so? Sorry, yes, on Malaysia, uh, basically uh, we have a we have a, a, a mixed view. Well, I, I am a little bit uh, uh, problematic on the exchange rate issue. I think that uh, from our studies, the exchange rate of the ringgit is overvalued and and probably should go down a little bit more. But the central bank does not seem to. Uh, to agree, and they, they, they continue to have a, a ringgit that is very, very stable. So unless this inconsistency is uh, solved, in my opinion, there continue to be problems. And I think that the, the, the delayed reaction of the Malaysian economy uh, to the world crisis with those two quarters, and also the second quarter strongly negative, uh, uh, as opposed to other countries in which the economy was, uh, was much better, is also due to some problem with the exchange rate valuation, in which Malaysia is probably losing a little bit of competitiveness against its, uh, its, its main competitors. Uh, Luca, the next question is also for you. When will China change its currency policy to either floating the renminbi or changing the peg? I mean, that's a question from one of our viewers. I think not very soon. I think that everybody is happy with this. Uh, the U.S. is happy because it can, uh, it can finance its deficit uh, rather cheaply, and China is happy because it can provide temporarily, uh, temporary stimulus to a, a whole part of its uh, industry that is not covered by fiscal stimulus. You know that fiscal stimulus in China is mostly on, on domestic demand, and if you have something else that provides uh, protection for those export industry, uh, uh, then it's fair enough. And, and, and this something else is exchange rate stability, so the exchange rate that stops appreciating against the U.S. dollar. So I'm not convinced that it's going to, they're going to get rid of this new uh, peg because it basically profits to everybody in this phase. In 20 seconds, would such a move cause a currency crisis at all? No, not at all. Uh, not at all. But this this move, I mean, you have to have a real change, or a real rebound, a strong rebound of the Chinese economy, even stronger than what we are seeing now, uh, to convince the Chinese authorities to get rid of this new peg. Lucas Lipa of Netixis, thank you so much for being with us. And of course, our thanks goes to uh, Raymond Tang, who joins us in Kuala Lumpur.